What is your name? Varsha Pilbra. Varsha Pilbra. And what do you do? I teach anatomy. Uh -huh. and I do research in human evolution. Ah, okay. What kind of research? Um, I mostly look at the dentition of apes and I try to work out patterns of variation within species of apes mm -hmm. because I'm interested in the question of what a species is in the paleontological context. Mm -hmm. Because when we have fossils, we don't usually have the numbers for fossils and we try to make assumptions about what an entire population is like based on just a few fossils and so we don't really have a sense of what kind of variation one expects to find in a population and in a species. Okay. And we can only do that from the comparative context. So I studied chimpanzees because they were mostly very closely related to humans. Both Panpaniscus and Tricholetes? That's correct, yes. All right. And uh, what's the most important thing about human evolution that students should know? Well, I think the, the most important thing that they probably ought to know is that we are quite unique in quite a few things that we do. So the fact that we stand on two legs is a very unique thing. And But understanding that uniqueness of humans uh, can only be understood from a context where we look at our evolutionary relatives. So we really need to understand chimpanzees to be able to understand humans better. Now, it's, it's, when I watch films of... Uh, uh, bonobos and normal chimps, I see that the bonobos seem to be more bipedal than normal chimps. Is that right? Yes, they seem to be. They, I think bonobos spend more time upright than normal chimps do. They've got a leaner body build. And why do they, they spend more time up, upright? Um, it's I'm not quite sure why. And so, so in fact, there has been some, you know, some people have suggested that perhaps bonobos are more closely related to humans than the chimps are. Well, that's then, impossible. I, even I know that. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I don't think that is true at all. I don't think that they are. I mean, in fact, we do know now that it's not that the bonobos are closer to humans. They're both equally as close uh -huh. to humans. But bonobos do tend to spend, and it could well be just because that's the, their agile body and their limbs are positioned in such a way. Both the chimpanzees and the, and the bonobos tend to walk upright whenever they can get a chance, but they, they're not biomechanically walking upright in the same way. Okay. Yeah. All right, now one thing that I'm interested in is this plot over here. Yeah. Could you run, walk us through this plot here? Uh, can you point to particular... Yeah. So what this is showing is really the evidence that we have for human all the way, so the fossil evidence, which goes back to about six million years. So where are the chimps so, in this? So the chimps will be just about here, uh -huh. right there. So the chimps branch out about, you know, between six and seven million years, and then the evidence seems to suggest that all of this, these are related to humans. Now something like that, yes. Cyanthropus, yes. could well be at the branching point between humans and chimps. So that might be an ancestor of a chimp rather could, than our ancestor. Could well be. Some people have suggested that. Uh -huh. But there are features in there as well that are, that are you know, human-like. And the same thing for Aurorin tugenensis. So interestingly enough, Sahelanthropus chardensis we know from a skull. Aurorin we know from long bones. So there uh -huh. were different parts of the anatomy I see. preserved. But they've got bits of the anatomy that seem to be more in the human lineage, and there are bits of the anatomy that seem to be more chimp-like. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, now how about uh, those ages? How accurate are those ages? Um, the, the time periods here are quite a few of them are radiometric. So yeah. I think we have a, quite, quite a good confidence in the time. So, for example, on the other hand, you have three, you have a trivergence right here. Yes. And that's usually kind of, kind of means that you don't know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that's the thing. And which of these, so this is very, you know, that is clearly someone's idea about how the splitting happened. And that is just one person's idea. So that doesn't necessarily mean that's a consensus view. Well, they have yeah. one, two, so, three, four trivergences. That's right. So quite a few times. So what this, they're saying here is that Ardipithecus was the lineage that went on then to, you know, is more closely related to humans out of those two that are up there. Oh, the Ardipithecus. Uh, Ardipithecus is closer than Sahelanthropus or Aurora. And the fact that it stops here means that it went extinct. Well, That's the course, most recent course, fossil? Yep, so then they went off, you know, they then went extinct at that point, And then something from Ardipithecus on then went on to become Australopithecus. And then each of them then split out. Do you think Ard 
you think that sometimes we are given responsibility for killing Neanderthals. Do you think the Australopithecus are responsible for killing Artipithecus? Uh, it is an interesting world. So what happens here is there's a good million years at least in between those two. And so lots could have happened mm. along the way. Whether these two, and, and when we go later on from about you know four million years onwards, it looks like many of them were living at the same time. Uh -huh. So these are species that are sympatric they could have well have been living in the same eco niche at the same time. Yes, but, but these look like they overlap the here, right here. They overlap, right. so they, they could have right. killed. They could have, well, it could have been, but I, yeah, it's a bit speculative, I guess, to say that, like, <laughs> what their relationships were. Yes. I, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, can you show us some of the skulls and where they belong yeah. on this? Uh, yeah. On this. So this one here is is a composite skull. So this is what does that put mean? Together, oh. Bits of the fossils have been put together from different individuals to make up a whole skull. I see. Um, this is a supposedly a skull of Australopithecus afarensis, otherwise known as Lucy. Oh, that's a Lucy skull. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is the common, the one that's usually described, and this is a, the, one of the very well-known ones, and that so what, sits right there. Right, right. The, yep. Yeah. Right. Could you point to it again? Right here. Right there. Okay. Yeah. Now, what's different about that? Why, if these were alive, how would we, they look? Um, I think that this, in fact, this individual was a fairly small size, about you know one meter, one point two meters in height. So, like um, uh, the Hobbit. Something like that. Yeah. Very small, very small brain case, about three hundred cubic centimeters. Uh, bipedal. Uh, yes, but only partially bipedal. So not um, quite the same bipedality as humans. More than a gibbon, but less than us. So more than a gibbon, more than a chimpanzee when a, or a bonobo that walks by uh -huh. purely, uh -huh. but less than us. Okay, and uh, do you think it spoke? Uh, it is speculative. In fact, the thing about language is really we're not at all sure how to test that from the fossil record. Um, and all they can do is work on, you know, if they've got an endocast, they can work on, you know, where the language centers are located. So unlikely. Could I yeah. stare it in the face here? Let me, yes. that's a stare it right in the face. And so you think this thing might, probably didn't talk? I don't think so. Did it make tools? Stone um, tools? There's, the evidence for stone tools, interestingly, comes later on in time. That's not to say that they didn't make tools. They may have, might have had tools that were that didn't preserve in the fossil record. Uh huh. Yeah, because they've got we've got evidence of their hand bones, uh -huh. and that they show that they were capable of doing some kind of um, grasping with Did, their hand. Could yeah. they grasp with their feet? Well, they are interestingly enough. So this is Australopithecus afarensis. We know that the big toe in the Australopithecus afarensis was in line with the other toes. Uh huh. So they didn't have grasping. Oh, toes, so no opposable big toes. Well, not to the same extent. I see. Yes. Like ours then. Yes. yes. I see. And the next one you're going to show us. Yep. And so this. That one was Australopithecus afarensis. Australopithecus afarensis. Yeah. And this is Australopithecus africanus. So they look to be the contemporaries of each it's, other. So these were slightly. That was a little bit later. Well, I mean, in real time. So this was about four to three million years old, uh -huh. and these fossils are most of them af after three million years. After more recent yeah. than three. So more, yeah, more recent than okay. three, and these are the ones now from South Africa. Uh huh. Whereas Afarensis is, is from East Africa, from Tanzania and Ethiopia. I see. Yeah. And uh, do you think that that could be my great 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 grandmother? Yes. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. Okay, and yours too. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. see. And how do you know that? Why do you think that? Well, there are very clear features that show them being in the human lineage. Like which features? So, for example, you take a look at that, that okay. big hole at the base yeah. of the skull. Yes. Okay. That, notice that it is very close to the anterior end here of the skull. Uh-huh. Yep. What that means is when this animal uh -huh. was trying to move around, uh -huh. the vertebral column would have gone directly downward like that. Aha. Uh -huh. And that's that's different yes. from the Australopithecus well, so afarensis? So if you were to compare, and this is a very interesting comparison, if you take a look, can you see how this one has moved further down compared to that? Show that again? Yep. It's further this down. One, yeah. Further towards the face, to the, to the, to oh, the front yes, of the Oh, yes, yes, you can see that, yep. yes. 
Let me get this in focus. There. Okay, yes, there it is. So point that out with your hand fingers, right, please. Yeah, yeah that's so, around the magnum right there. So four magnum is more towards the center of the skull than Correct. it is on than it is on the Australopithecus afarensis. afarensis yeah. so, and that means that they were more bipedal. That, that means they were more bipedal. The vertebral column now is directed But this is, this is also much bigger, right? Yes. Um, so that, it could well have been, so this is quite robust, but remember, this is a composite skull. I see. That's been put together. Yep. And how about cooking? Do you think that uh, these things cook their food? It, well, it's unlikely. We don't have evidence for fire till later, till about that stage here. Till about which Homo stage? Homo and Homo erectus. But that's we the... Till we get to the genus Homo. I see, but yeah. that doesn't mean that they didn't cook, it's just no. that that's the most recent yeah. evidence. That's, that's the best evidence that we have for fire. Well, the best, I see, yeah. but, but it could very well have been earlier, right? Yes. Yeah. Can you see whether you cook from the size of your teeth and the strength of your jawbone? You, mus your muscle? you can tell what, how um, difficult or what their masticatory stresses were on their jaw by looking at the size of their teeth and the size of these openings here. Uh-huh, that that's where the jaw muscles yeah, come in. those are the jaw muscles. These are pretty big right. openings. <laughs> those are big ones. So these are the temporalis muscles that have, would, have, would have gone through there. Could you compare it to the modern human being yeah, to so show how look, different they are? Yeah, let's take a look at that. So if you look at that. Okay, so we're looking at the yep. opening yep. here yes. is much bigger than the opening over, over here, or yes. is it? Yep. Is it? Well, I guess the skull is much bigger. So the skull is much bigger, and the opening is smaller. But I think the way to look at it, another way to look at it, mm -hmm. is I'm going to put this down so that I can show this to you, is take a look at this pinching. The pinching. And that oh. is called post-orbital constriction. Post-orbital constriction. Show us that again, please. This bit here. That's pinching, post-orbital constriction. And what's the sense of that? that? With that. Yeah, there's very little post-orbital yep. constriction. So, so what is happening here is that the brain size has increased as well. Yes. Well, do you, do chimpanzees have post-orbital yes, constriction? They do. Yes, they do. Yes. So it's a it's an ancestral it is trait. An ancestral trait. And gibbons as well. Yes. And then we got rid of it. And we seem to have so with the brain case expanding, with the frontal lobe expanding, uh -huh. that space has been taken up. Right. Yep. Huh. And we use that to uh, play music or something. And we use that to store <laughs> images in our yeah. What part of the brain gets? What part of the brain is right there that it has expanded? Well, I think that's where the temporal lobe sits. Uh -huh. On the front, the outside the temporal lobe, and then the frontal lobe sits right in the, here in the region of the forehead. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. And so that's that was Australopithecus afarensis. Af Af this one is Africanus. Africanus. Yeah. Africanus. All right. Now this here. I don't know whether you, this is a very interesting one. Okay, why is it interesting? The reason it's interesting is because there are features about this skull. It's like a gorilla. Make, exactly, <laughs> that make you think, is that in the human lineage? And how, if it is, then why is it? Because there are things here that look like a gorilla. And the thing that students take a look at and what confuses students a lot is the fact that they've got this little crest here. Sagittal crest. The sagittal like, crest. Like men, like a man, like yes. a true man. That's right. And so the reason they have the sagittal crest is because those same chewing muscles that I was talking about, the temporal muscles have gone up oh. and have an attachment site a lot higher. Oh. And uh, what, what's the purpose of that? And so what it means is that, and that also if you take a look at this, you can only see remnants of the teeth here. Oh. Really large chewing teeth. Really large chewing teeth. Like, show me it again, please. Yeah, can you see that? Really large chewing teeth. Oh. Yeah. So, so what does that mean? They the didn't cook their food or something? Certainly didn't cook their food, but whatever they were doing with their teeth was really heavy chewing. So lots of mastication, which explains the fact that that same fossil that I talked about. Yes. The temporal fossa That's gigantic is really there. big. That is yep. really big there. Yep. That hole there. Temporal yep. fossa. You the temporal call fossa, yeah. Okay. Yep. And, and when did that creature live? Um, this, in fact, was later. So this was about... This, these two were contemporaneous to some extent. Oh. Yeah. And that one was our ancestor and this one not? This one seems to have been closer in our lineage than that one. So this is clearly an extinct... Branch. Do you have any DNA from these guys? No, not for these. We don't have evidence for DNA going so far back in time. Uh huh. And these were all in Africa? Yes, they're still, at this point, yeah, they're still in Africa. 
And I've been told that uh, primates are not Afrotheres, that primates evolved outside of Africa. Yes. So where did primates evolve? So many of them all over the world. Um, it seems like the earliest primates are, the earliest, many of the earliest primates are in Madagascar and Southeast Asia, um, even in North America, the earliest ones. But then, then the more recent ones are spread essentially in the more in the old world and in the new world they're just in South America. Mm. Yeah. But the ones in South America are called New World monkeys right. because they're geologically later in time. And uh, as an earth scientist we know that Africa and South America split about 90 or 100 million years ago and then the question becomes where did these New World monkeys, how did they get to the New World? Because apparently they are more closely related than 90 million years. It's more like 30 or so. Well, that's right. So they, that's right. Yeah. So how do you explain that? Um, I think that so most of the evidence for the New World monkeys comes from about the Oligocene, which is about 35, you know, 35 to 40 million years ago. There have been lots of ideas about how they went over, but I think the consensus seems to be, be that they went on a landmass that floated across. A landmass that yeah. floated across? You don't yeah. mean a log? No, no, no. Unlikely a raft. You mean a chain of land. islands? No. I think so. It's more likely a chain of islands that went across. Yeah. Do you know where it went? Um, I, well, I think that that's probably the best idea that we have. It's probably you know idea of continental drift moving over to mm. that side, but it's unlikely that they were moving on sh a short raft that you know went over because the radiation is far too big mm -hmm. to explain a small little raft. And you know. panthers and cougars, same thing? Um, possibly, okay. yeah. All right, so can you continue on our skull search? Yes. All right. Um, and then we get to the point where at about two and a half million years or so, uh -huh. so we see the first evidence of a group that's much more like humans. And that's where you first, they first been called Homo. So that's the first Homo. Yes. And what makes them, why do you call them Homo? What's so good um, about them so that they're called our, our genus? Yes, and so they, when they had a look at the, when they, these, when these were discovered, there were quite a few things about this that made people think that, well, this seems to be in our, in our lineage. The fact that, you know, you start to see the globular brain case Oh, a little bit of the forehead sticking up there. Correct, yes. Yeah. So now they've got a, a, a more a clear forehead. And not as um, big a constriction. That's right. The post-orbital constriction has re is now reduced. Post-orbital constriction now reduced. How about the chewing muscles? Is that reduced too? Yeah, those are reduced as well. Uh -huh. Take a look at that. They're still big, uh -huh. uh, but they're smaller the teeth. size. Yes. How about this foramen magnum? Has the, that been more so towards the, the bottom? So now the foramen magnum has moved anteriorly again, so it's much more... So take, if I was... Uh -huh. My finger down there. Yes. Yep. It's moved forward. It's moved forward again. So they're more bipedal. So they're more bi bipedal. And how long ago was this our ancestor? Um, this was something like two and a half million years. Two ago. and a half. And did they use tools? At this time here, you start to see evidence of tools. Fire? Um, not quite. So this is Homo habilis. So you have evidence of tools, but not really good evidence of fire. Cooking. Um, still not great evidence for cooking. You see that, but they were tool users. That's why they called they were called Mahabalus. Ah, yeah, the handyman. who gave them that name? Is that Louis Leakey? I think it was Louis Leakey. Louis Leakey. Yeah. Okay, and so that was found in East Africa. That's right. In Kenya. Yeah. It's um, Tanzania. In, in Tanzania. Yeah. Uh huh. Old yeah, Gorge. Old Gorge. So that skull is from Old Gorge. Yes. So they were living in Tanzania, what is now Tanzania, three yes. or two and a half million two years ago. Two and a half million years ago. Two and a half, but was it, how about the climate then? Um, I think that, interestingly enough, around, around two and a half million years ago, it seems to have been a change in climate. Uh -huh. And often, um, geologists and people who do climate studies think of that as being a time of changeover, when there must have been some change, not just in hominins, but many of the other fauna changed as well. And so there was an, a, a faunal turnover event that happened at about two and a half million years. R what kind of turnover? Uh, it's called a faunal turnover. Faunal turnover. What yeah. was different? There were deer instead of, of kangaroos or something? And lots of the antelopes changed. So there are ah. new, lots of new species of antelopes. It seems like the new species of antelopes that you have are seen in the fossil record are much more savanna dwelling. Rather than rather than forest dwelling. Oh, that. so the yes. forest dried up and turned into savanna two and a half million. Around two and a half million. Years. Do you think that was an important part of the environmental? It appears to have been an important part of the um, the backdrop 
where the evolution of humans then took place. Do you think yeah. it's related to this thing becoming more bipedal? Apparently, yes. And I think there's quite a lot of evidence that seems to suggest that those events sort of took place around the same time. Yeah. Hmm. And so what color skin did that thing have? Um, was it really dark because it lived near the equator? Possibly. I mean, I would imagine that the skin was dark. I mean, I would, once again, you know, that is... Um, very speculative because we don't have the genetic evidence for it and we don't have any f soft tissue at all. Uh -huh. But we can only go by, you know, what chimpanzees are like or what animals that are living there are like at the moment. Uh -huh. And based on that, yes, one would assume. Yeah. And uh, how about language? Uh, I would imagine that they would have some ability to communicate. Why? Uh, because to be able to live in that atmosphere and to make tools. And there are this evidence that they were able to take their tools from one place and use it in another place. They had must have had some kind of ability to communicate. How many how many uh, specimens of Homo hamilus do you have? Um, the, by now, now the specimen numbers uh, um, start to increase a fair bit. But There's ten. Numbers are not. Yeah, I would imagine ten or twelve or something like What's that. What's their age distribution at death? Oh. Or in other words, what's the life expectancy of Homo habilis? Was it 50 yeah. or 10 or 20? Or? Oh, I, well, I would say 30 or 35. 30 or 35? Yeah, yeah. Huh. Well, st and the, the same thing for all of these so far that we've talked about? I, I would think so, yeah. yeah. 30 or 35 yeah, years? Yeah. I mean, I think even, you know, chimpanzees, these days in zoos, they may live longer. Uh -huh. But in the wild, yeah. Could you show us the comparison between Homo habilis and uh, us, Homo sapiens? Yep. Yeah. What I don't have here a good example of is what is happening in between because we've got, you know, Homo erectus and all the other ones where the oh. brain size increases. So this gets to be a bit, a, a really big jump. That is a big jump. So yep. brain size factor of two or three? Yep. So, so factor of two or three. And how long did it take to go from the brain size here to the brain size of a modern human? So this is, you know, we're, now we're talking from about two and a half million years yes. to the present. Yes. And that's a big jump. But you can actually see, if you take a look at, you know, brain size increase, and if I had the fossils that lie in between, you'd be able to see. I mean, some of the brain size increase is in spurts, and yeah. some of it is much more gradual. Ah, really? Yeah. Can you plot that as a function of time over the last three million years? Um, well, it has been done, yeah. So there are, the brain size doesn't increase typically, you know, when you go from Australopithecus, uh -huh. even till you get to about Homo habilis, the brain size increases, but really just slightly and in fact many people have you know thought about what it is what is it that makes that the genus homo rather than australopithecus yes. and one of the defining characters has been the size of the brain case so people have said well you know you've gone past the 350 mil mark uh -huh. to, now you get to about 600 mils you get to about 700 mil brain um, size. and ours is how many mil? ours is about 1400 1400 mil so yeah so it's quite a bit bigger yeah um but that jump then happens a lot later. It happens around, you know, there's probably goes to about, to about 800,000 years. And then again, past that point, there's another jump at about 200,000 years. Do you, know, do you know why the brain case is increasing? Um, quite a few things, I think. I'm not, we're not 100% sure why the brain case is increasing. But it, and, you know, many of these things clearly work together to create a larger brain case, I imagine. But you know, the fact that they were living in the savannah, the fact that, you know, they were probably had by this time incorporated meat into their diet. They probably were carnivores by now and hunting. And, you know, so they probably had a need for greater cognitive capacity. For hunting? For, perhaps for hunting. Not for socializing As and well. flirting with yes. men and women, yes. flirting Same together? Thing, looking after the young, you know? <laughs> How about socialization? Were all of these things, did they live in groups of 10, 20, 30, 40? Um, the population sizes are a little bit difficult to work out because I think even by even at this point, humans or hominins are still quite a, a small percentage of the biota. Yes. You know, they don't make up this big percentage of the biota. So you can imagine that their population sizes are still quite small. No, but not the population size, but rather the groups. The group sizes. The group relative size. to that. I would imagine that they would have, you know, just once again, you know, all we can go by is what the what chimpanzees are like now, uh -huh. and so one would imagine that they had, you know, not not very big, so say twenty or thirty individuals. Twenty or thirty individuals, yeah. and can you tell us where the sex of these skulls? Quite often, 
I think, yeah, I think that one has been described as being female. And how do you know that? Um, most of the features apparently. So this, the same thing here. The what is that? The mastoid process. The ma let me j just for a second, just a yeah, second. Right uh, mastoid process. Is that big or small yeah, or something? It's small. It's small. So female, yeah. Yeah. female Australopithecus afarensis have no, Africanus yeah. have small. What? Mastoid process. Mastoid <laughs> process. Okay. All right. Mastoid process. Yeah. And. All right, and the male version would be fifty percent bigger or something. Well, or? Quite a bit bigger. Yeah, that one. So this is all. This one is the one that's called Mrs. Plez. Mrs. Plez. Mrs. Plez. Why yes. are they called that? Well, it was because when they first found that fossil, it had a different genus name. It was called Plesianthropus. Oh. Yeah, and so it was called Mrs. Plez for short. And the Homo sapiens skull here. Yeah. Could you could you tell us that's a male or a female? So this is the one that appears to be a male. Because. And it has. The, so this is a really well-preserved skull, so you can see all of the characteristics that you need to see. So you can take a look at the very protruding, uh, protruding occipital region right there. Occipital region. Yep. So occipital a, a condyle or something, or it's called a protuberance. Protuberance. Yep. And I have one of those bigger than yours. Probably. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, why do men have that? Um, What's the I purpose think, of that? Yeah, that's really where all the muscles that work on the neck. Attached. So my head is bigger, so I need more muscles. You need, yep, you need more muscles to balance the weight of your skull. Hmm. And how about females? If if there were any other differences in males um, and females? Yep, and so that is, that one is going to be reduced in females. The same thing here. Which the, one? The, this is the mastoid process. The mastoid process. Yep. What's that do? Um, that again provides attachment to muscles that, of mastication. Oh, mm -hmm. and men chew harder than women. Men or something? have bigger, well, bigger jaws, and therefore they need bigger muscles. Okay, so it's just a function of size it's then. Fun it's very fun much a function of size and robusticity, yes. Now, men in, are usually bigger than women. Yes. For all these other critters, do you think the males are bigger than the females? It looks like, yes, in fact, the uh, closer you go to the uh, branching point to chimpanzees, the sexual dimorphism was greater. Greater? Yes. So in chimpanzees were, than in, in well, human beings? in the hominins that are closer to the chimpanzee lineage, uh -huh. so late, earlier in time, there was more sexual dimorphism than later on in time. Oh, so we have less sexual dimorphism than our, our ape ancestors. Correct. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Huh. But gibbons don't have much. Gibbons don't have sexual dimorphism. So much. orangutans and gorillas do. do. Chimps have a little less, and we have even less. Yes. But the ancestral state might have been even less because the gibbons are more, might be more representative of that ancestral state. It could well be, yes. But I think that at least the fossils that we have for apes seems to suggest that they were dimorphic. Well, how about among the non-apes, which is the closest uh, monkey to us? Do you know that? Among the non-apes, which is the closest. Yeah, if they get, you go the old world monkeys. The old world monkeys, and yeah. all of them equally distant? Um, well, I don't think that we know exactly which one, which of the old world monkeys is closest, but I think they're all, yeah, whether, we, whether it's, you know, Cercopithecines or Cercopithecines, I don't think that we have worked out which of those ones is more uh -huh. related. Really? Well, that surprises me because we could do DNA on them. I suppose. And you would figure that out. Yeah. But when the splitting happen and which ones are more ancestral to the apes, yeah. When did that sure. split happen? Like. 20 million years ago, 25? Um, well, the split between gibbons and orangutans happened around 20 million years or so. And I, think the I mean gibbons the and the rest and, of us. And the rest of the apes, that's right. <laughs> and, <but laughs> us included, yeah. Okay. And that, when was that? And I think that was somewhere between 18 and 20 million 18 and 20 million, okay. Yeah. And then... Is that date based on molecular clocks? It is, yeah. But also based on molecular clocks tied down to the fossil evidence. I see. Yeah, because you but, need some kind of factor to tie it down. And the to. next branch point, we're not so sure about. And the next branch point, you know, further it's back old, in time, that's yes. the one that we're not 100% yes. sure, but I would imagine that would have been somewhere around 30. 30? Yeah. Hmm. OK. And uh, could you point out a few features of the human skull that, I mean, we all have these skulls. Mm. Could you give us a little tour of the human skull to let us know what we're made of? Like, our, could you show us our ears, for example? That looks like a nice hole into your skull, is the... Yep, so that's right. And so that is a, you know, 
um, that's quite important because it allows us to you know take a look at so the semicircular canals are quite important because that can, helps us. Can to, we see them? Can we see the semicircle? Are they inside? No, no, they're too far deep. They're inside. too far deep inside. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And how about, why don't we have bones in our nose? They look like they're, they look broken, but they're not really broken. That's the way it is. Yes. So why is that? Of, lots of cartilaginous features there. But the, the human nose, in fact, this nose is quite small. If you compare this nose with modern humans with the nose of Neanderthals, yes. you've noticed that that opening is a lot bigger. In Neanderthals. In Neanderthals. So this, these seem to be adapted to warmer climate than cold climate. I see. Now, one thing that I've been told is that humans have a chin. Could you pick oh, up? Oh, yeah. Now, so my question is, what, what's the purpose of a chin? <laughs> what, why do we have a chin? Um, what's the, so good? Let me hold it up next to your chin, please. Yes. Okay. A little bit closer, a little bit closer. So what's the purpose of our chins? I don't understand. It, we, I mean, that's really a very important question because chins are one character that define modern humans. Yeah, so why do we have one? Um, what, what the heck is it good for? Yeah, we don't really know. I mean, there's lots of ideas. Are you to hold your hand? <laughs> there are lots of... I mean, sometimes people, some people have said, well, you know, when, we, when our face got pushed back in, um, it just so happens that, you know, with that, and the face got pushed back in because now we're not fi- oh, focusing so much on our chewing so muscles. So instead of having prognaceous jaw, it yeah, came back in, came and then the in, chin didn't go back as far. the chin didn't go, but that doesn't make sense. Why would the chin not go back <laughs> yeah, so far? Yeah, right, right. And the interesting thing is, if you actually were to cut that in half, yes. and you were to take a look at it, you'll notice that down there, at the bit of the chin, yes. that's where there's a lot of cortical bone. Cortical bone. Yes, so okay. that's really thick bone. Okay. That's important. Whoa. And that's why, you know, this, the saying in the past was take it on your take chin. Take it on the chin. You know, it's, it was meant to be something that you could take your blow on, and people had those ideas as, as well. You know, it's possible there was something that was a defense mechanism, but none of those seem to be, when they've tested, they haven't really managed to find any evidence from them. So do you have any kind of pet it, favorite ideas? It about? was so other ideas that I think, I'm, I'm sort of, there's two different kind of ideas about, you know, the chin. One is sort of a just so thing, where it's called, you know, a spandrel hypothesis, mm-hmm. where, you know, it's a morphology that follows on from something else. So what were the so, things that it followed from? That? So some of the things are that there's a big, the, these are the attachment wait, 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 sites where? right there. Where? Just a, right, can just a second, let me get in focus. There's attachment sites. For the tongue. Oh. Yep. And okay. so because we do a lot of... Tongue wagging. <laughs> yep, tongue wagging. And so we need to have a big tongue, and that then allows us that, that cortical bone is really important as an attachment site oh. for the tongue. It turns out that I don't like that idea too much because it turns out that we don't do any more movements of the tongue than animals that don't use their tongue in quite the same way. So mm. the idea was that we speak, and so we use our tongue, and therefore we have a chin. I don't think that really adds up. The other idea is that, you know, this having that chin there mm-hmm. stops that kind of wishboning. Wishboning? When you're chewing? Yep, when you're chewing. Oh. And so the tendency would be for these two parts of the jaw to split apart. Oh. And that the chin then provides the buttressing. Oh, it's a flying buttress. Yep. <laughs> I see, okay. Um, and I don't know whether that that is a good idea either. So honestly, of all the things, and then of course, you know, there are people who say that that's a, a sexually selected trait because that is, you know, a square um, jaw with a prominent chin is meant to be attractive in males. Do you find that attractive, a uh, prominent jaw? That, yes, well, a lot of people will look at that and say, and of course you can take a look at someone who has a chin. Well, how about you personally? Uh, yes, I think so. You yeah. like men with prominent jaws. I would imagine, yeah. Does your husband have a prominent jaw? <laughs> I hope so, yeah. You hope so? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't choose him for that character? No, it wasn't no. just that. Like maybe you chose him for his brain size? Yes, yeah. <laughs> so you were responsible for making Homo sapiens have larger brains because you yeah. chose a man with a larger brain. Yeah. You rejected men with smaller brains. Yes. <laughs> Do you, is, are you serious about that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't. I have to think back again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what else about humans? Like uh, those teeth, for example. Yeah. Can you look at those teeth and say, ah, this critter was eating cooked food? Um, is that possible or is that not possible? Well, you can do lots with with teeth, and you can do microwave studies and take a look at what kind of things the people were eating. Now, this one here, this is an interesting one, because if you take a look, it's got... If you hold it very still, I can yep. zoom in on there, okay? Yep. Yeah? It's got what? Yep. So if you take a look, that's one molar, and that's the second molar. Yes. Where are the, the third, other ones? The third one isn't there. Why not? 
um, in this case here, at least there is the space for it. Yes. You see there? But it hasn't erupted. And that's so another. no wisdom teeth? No wisdom teeth. Now, I, had, I have wisdom. Most humans have wisdom teeth, I right? don't have wisdom teeth. You don't? No. So you're like this person you're yeah. holding? Yeah. I see. So what fraction of Homo sapiens have wisdom teeth? Oh, well, I don't, I'm, I'm not quite sure on the statistics, but I do know that Asian populations typically have congenital absence of wisdom teeth. Uh-huh. Yeah. How about Australian Aborigines? Do you know that? I think they do have wisdom teeth more commonly. Okay, and yeah. Europeans do? Europeans do as well, yeah. How about hairiness? That seems to vary across human populations as mm -hmm. well. Some, mm -hmm. some people are hairy and some less so. Yeah. Unless so, once again, I think, yeah. Now, I've noticed that you have hair on your head yeah. and not so much on the rest of your body, yeah. and chimpanzees have more hair. Yeah. So where, did, where in this evolutionary process did we lose our body hair? Well, there are ideas about that, but we're not quite sure what it does look like sometime in our, you know, from the time we get to be modern hom humans or homo sapiens sapiens, we seem to have had a smaller heck out, you know, of, uh, less hair cover than the previous ones. Um, where along the way we lost our hair, and as you know, there's you know, an aquatic ape theory, mm -hmm. which seems to suggest that we lost our hair along the way. And uh, I honestly, I don't, you know, it's, it's too far out for me to, it's very speculative. How about wearing clothes? That again, I mean, that seems to have come somewhere along, I would, and this again is, you know, me just thinking, you know, at the moment, I would imagine that getting used to the um, elements could have been our, uh, evolutionary history where we lived in Europe in cold environments um, where we started to have clothes for the first time. So I have clothes. Mm -hmm. And language, how about building houses, anything there? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, we, we definitely see evidence for shelters. Did, who, did all of these creatures live in caves? Most of them lived in caves, yeah. In caves? Well, I think these ones must have probably lived in the savanna. Savannah. Which it's not until later on we start to see evidence of, of um, cave dwelling. Oh. Yeah. A lot later. And uh, Neanderthals, if we had a Neanderthal skull here, yes. it would, I've been told that they had brain cases bigger than ours on That's average. That's correct, yeah. So they were smarter than we were. Yeah, well, I don't know, but they definitely had bigger brain cases, but whether the bigger brain cases went, went with the bigger mm -hmm size of the skull altogether. Mm -hmm. We certainly had bigger brain cases than modern humans do. Do you think Homo sapiens played a role in making the Neanderthals go extinct? It is a difficult question and for a long time I think that theory was a popular one. Now whether they um, actively played a role in, you know, in making them go extinct, it's not quite sure at all. But it does happen that, and I'm I, seem to, I think I would subscribe to the idea that climatic change uh, caused them to dwindle in size. You mean getting colder? Yeah, or you know, going from glacial periods to non-glacial periods, so they were adapted to climatic, very, very cold environments. Oh, I see. And then they were not adapted to the changes. So happened. the intergla did they die out in an interglacial period? Well, I think they slowly probably dwindled at that point, yeah. I see. And uh, now how about this migration? Do we have a map of migration of modern human populations? Can you, is this uh, something that you teach your students here? Yes, yeah. So we came, now there's a one right there in the middle of Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, that presumably is where our ancestors uh, grew up and survived for a million so years? This, yeah. So this seems to be the one, so that is, around the place where modern humans originated. Couldn't it have been further south in South Africa? It could well have been, yeah. And in fact, you know, there is evidence that there's greater genetic diversity in sub-Saharan Africa yes. um, than there is in the rest of Africa as well. Which yeah. is indirect evidence for the source being That's there. Right. So why did you draw the one in uh, Congo rather than in Namibia? I think that what they're saying is that that, you know, they. It's not clear at all, you know, where they got this from, but it could well be that then they came from there and then they spread from there. Right. Yeah. And when did the people get to Australia? From what we know at the moment, we, they seem to say about 40,000 years. 40,000 years? Yeah, although this shows about 50,000 years and then some people say 60,000 years. On the but internet, yeah. you can see the Indian government trying to contact the Sentinelese. And I'm curious about the Sentinelese. These are people who live in the Andaman Islands, the oh, south see, part of the Andaman yeah. Islands. And, and these are presumably people alive today that haven't had contact. 
uh, not like the Jarawa Jarawa people who have been contacted. They're still kind of hunters and gatherers, but the <coughs> Sentinelese have not been contacted. Have you? Do you know anything about that? Oops, no, no. you don't know anything about that. No. Okay. Uh, let's see. What else could? What else? What else? helps you, I mean, why did you start studying these things? Does it help you understand who you are as a person, or who um, we are, or why yeah. are you studying this? Yeah, I mean, uh, it helps us me understand who we are, and also helps me understand, you know, why we have spread throughout the world, why we are as globally spread, or globally adapted um, as we are, and what's the difference then with, between humans who live in environments that are developed versus humans that live in environments that are not developed or isolated. Yeah. So what do you think is the most important difference between humans and these are our, I guess, more ape-like ancestors or our ancestors? How, what is the, I mean, a lot of people are saying, oh, we're unique because of blah, 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 blah. But how about, how are we not unique? How, what are the commonalities? Um, between humans and... And our ancestors. So, well. First of all, our living, uh, our, our living relatives, the cousins, our yeah. chimps and yeah. gorillas, and but also our more ancient ancestors. Um, I guess the things that are that probably would be common would be, you know, um, the our mode of locomotion has been around for a very long time. So being bipedal. Being bipedal has been. So around. I mean, that's not what, in quite the same way. But so about three million years or so. Yeah. Okay. Um, with with apes, I think a lot of the a lot of our social behaviors uh -huh. are very common. Like what, for example? Um, well, with chimpanzees, I think humans share that same strain of uh, being aggressive. Hmm. Uh, with you know, and that you know that quality of um, making war seems to be something that we have inherited. Well, what about yeah. bonobos? I've been told that we're not that's quite sure whether they are as violent yes, as uh, right. other so chimps. Is, and this is the interesting thing. So bonobos are far more peacemakers than chimpanzees. And we would hope that there are things that we share with bonobos as well. Okay. And I think there are quite a few things that we share with bonobos. The ability with, to be able to, um, to, do, to make peace. How about sex? I've heard that some zoos do not put bonobos in their zoos because they have sex so much that the children would get upset and, and their parents would get embarrassed. Yes. Is that true? Well, bonobos seem to manage to diffuse any tense situations by making by having sex. And, and in do fact, you know, as soon as even when they meet each other, when they greet each other, they do that in a sexual way. So why don't we do that more often? I, that's, well, I don't think, I think for humans, um, the sexual act is much more of a private thing. So even sex, sex for reproduction in humans is an act that takes time. Um, it is not an act that's done in quite the same way. So there's a difference between chimpanzees and bonobos in the way they, they have sex in that chimpanzees. When a female chimpanzee is in heat, mm -hmm. the males essentially stand in line and they wait their turn. But is that for bonobos as, as well? Bonobos are different and I think, you know, bonobos are, they just have sex and they even acts that are just friendly are made to be sexual acts. So when they greet each other, they greet each other by touching the genital organs, which is, you know, which humans may construe as being a sexual act. So would you say that the normal chimps are more po polygamous than bonobos? The normal chimps are... Well, another way to ask well, that question... they're more male-dominated, I think, in their... What social. does that mean in terms of offspring? Does that mean that the one alpha has more offspring compared to the beta and gamma males, but in bonobo society that the offspring are more evenly distributed among the males? It's possible. I think in the bonobo society, it's the female that is the dominant individual. So I've heard yeah. that in chimp societies that the females go, when they're born, they're the ones that leave the group. That's right. In bonobos, how is that? Well, I think that the, uh, interestingly enough, in both groups, I think it's the, the females that leave the group, but I think in the bonobos, the females are still the dominant ones oh. in the groups, yeah. The females leave the group and they're the dominant, that's kind of in the... But Yeah, but their group sizes, bonobos have much bigger group sizes than chimpanzees. Oh, they do? But they also live in environments that allow them, that sustain those larger group sizes. Oh. Yeah. 
I didn't. So when they go hunting, do they go hunting in as large a group as when chimps, yeah, normal so chimps and go? And bonobos don't hunt in quite the same way. They don't do as much hunting as chimpanzees. Yeah. Huh. How about religion? Now, I, human societies, I think, they all have some type of animistic, shamanistic... I mean, if we discover a tribe somewhere that no one has contacted before, mm -hmm. there's always some type of religious spirituality. Yeah. Now. What do we know about chimp spirituality? I don't know. I have no idea whether they have. I mean, we do know that you know chimpanzees don't appear to have the cognitive ability to, uh, you know, to retain things for a long time. So when they when they have fights, they you know they forget about them and come back. So which seems to suggest that you know they probably don't have that sense of otherness in quite the same way. So I think that gets to be a bit speculative. Now, male chimpanzees are kind of violent. Do you think there's wife abuse going on? Like the, if I'm an alpha male and that female over there starts to pay attention to another male, will I not just beat up on the other male, will I also beat up on the female and say, oh, you're bad for doing that? And um, but they do, but I don't think that's the thing. I think they simply do not bear grudges in quite the same way that humans do. Mm -hmm. I think their violence is very much an act that happens in the moment. How about homosexuality? Bonobos are described as being homosexual. But they're but just like crazy just multisexual. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So, so they're yeah. bisexual, yeah. trisexual, That's lesbian, right. yeah. uh, homosexual, well, they're everything. They, just, yeah, they're they love to be like LGBT, exactly. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. But how about the other chimps, normal chimps? Um, Troglodytes. Yeah, no, I don't know whether that whether they've documented same-sex relationships in. in the same world. questions, gorillas yeah. and gibbons so, and yeah. orangs. Same thing. I don't think that they've been they've documented that in the same way. Have you yeah. met Jane Goodall? No, I haven't. I mean, okay. Yeah. How about uh, the woman who did with the orangutans, Virtu oh, Galtigas? No, Have you met her? You haven't met her. No. Okay. How about the woman Diane Fossey? Yeah, Fossey. No, before You've never my met. Time. Okay. Before my okay. Time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, for students who are looking at the evolution of humans for the past, I don't know, 10 million years or so, what do you think that they should remember about who they are when they look at this history? Well, I think it should, it should give them the sense that, uh, you know, the aspects about their humanness that they think of as being unique has really has got a really long history. and. The only way, and this is interesting for us because we teach students who are going to be doctors and they're going to be in the medical profession. Yes. And it's and while we focus a lot on you know helping people in their health, it's probably important for us to understand that many of these um, ailments that we have can probably be helped by looking at that evolutionary history, and that's what I try to make them understand. The doctors. Yes, the would-be doctors, yeah. When I talk to doctors, they know very little about evolution. Yeah. I'm very surprised. Yes. They almost know nothing about it, and they don't even care. They think that disease or humans are... Well, I talk to doctors and lawyers, and they think humans are very different from all these other critters, and so they kind of minimize the connection we have with yes. other apes. But I think that's what's happening with the genetic studies these days. Because we are being able to map the genome, we can find, particularly when, or, you know, now we, have, we know, you know, genes um, that are responsible for some disease conditions, and we find those same genes, for, so, so for example, the genes that sh are shared between humans and Neanderthals. Yes, for example, I did 23 in me, and I'm 2.7% Neanderthal. So how did they, how did they, they sequence the whole genome of Neanderthals, and then they say, these genes are not in humans, but then they find, them, not in all humans, but they are in some humans, and that's how they identify that's right. Neanderthal genes? Yes. And that's what they that's what they seem to have done. They managed to find some Neanderthal genes. In fact, they've got some segments where there is there are clearly, you know, genes that are meant to be Neanderthal genes, but then there are some segments where you would expect to have Neanderthal genes and there are they, they're not there. So mm -hmm. there are sequences that are just missing. And those may well have been, you know, when the um, the genes probably were not selected for well, and how, been lost along the Well way. how about human genes? genes in Neanderthals. If I have 2.7% Neanderthal genes, 
how many human genes did that Neanderthal have? have been, yeah. But you don't know the percentages. No, no. Can you look at the Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA to figure out, usually when two populations come together, sometimes it's more the males are raping the women and therefore the, the Y chromosome That's becomes right. a dominant, yes. or the other way around, it's when the mothers are. So have we looked at the mitochondrial DNA versus the Y chromosome to see what type of relationship we had with Neanderthals? Yeah, I mean, I think that whole question of, you know, how much Neanderthal um, genetic material is in humans is only coming to the fore now, you know, when they've sequenced the Denisovan and they managed to get, and I think there's a lot more work to be done to find those, to, uh, to be able to answer those questions. But clearly, I don't know whether, or, or I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Yeah. All right, and uh, now, I haven't asked you anything about aliens. Now, this MOOC is a little bit about aliens, about uh, how did we get here, and we've talked about ev human evolution, but you talk about the increase in brain size. Mm -hmm. Can you say anything about whether you think the increase in brain size is a type of adaptation that we should expect in A, other creatures on Earth, and B, anybody out, the aliens? I think that, quite honestly, the way evolution works, there is no predictive power to evolution in quite the same way. Yes, I mean, I don't know, the, you know, the increase in brain size in particular, there's nothing to guarantee that it could just happen in another one. There's, I don't think that you can, you know, put a formula together and say, if these things, you know, are present, then yes, you know, there will be an increase in brain size. Evolution just doesn't work in, this, in that predictive way. And so it ends up being extremely speculative as to whether there will be another group that is intelligent in that way. So maybe, there may be aliens out there, but you know, how do you, that, how do you empirically test it? Well, one big debate that's in the astrobiology community is that whether we should expect, I, I often say to my students, your closest relatives in the universe are here on Earth. And if that's the case, then maybe we should not expect intelligent, human-like intelligence among aliens. What do you think of that? Um, I would, I think that I probably would agree with that. Uh, mostly, I think, so my take is going to have to be on, you know, based on the fact that my training is in evolutionary biology and just based on the way my understanding of evolution works, is that, you know, there may be creatures out there that are specialized, that have adapted very well, but whether that specialization relates to them being intelligent, the way we describe as intelligence in us humans, mm -hmm. that I don't know, I can't really, I don't think so. So, you know, it may, there may well be aliens out there that are really good at whatever way they are adapting to the environment, but whether that adaptation is intelligence, the way we describe intelligence in the increase in brain size, increased cognitive abilities, I don't think that as an evolutionary biologist, I can say that that would be the case. Now, Carl Sagan is somebody who's like the founder of the field of astrobiology in many ways. He said, he, quote, he coined the phrase functionally equivalent humans yes. or functionally equivalent hominids, I think. Yes. And the point was that although these aliens who are supposedly smart will not be genetically closely related to us, they will be functionally close to us as if there is a f convergence on the functions that our big brain does. Well, what do you think of that? Well, this idea of convergent evolution is an acceptable concept. So there is an understanding that, you know, yes, unrelated animals can converge on a particular adaptation. And that's, that can be seen. So when you have a radiation of, you know, marsupials in Australia, for example, yes, they do converge on particular habitats and particular adaptations that may be occupied by similar groups in different environments. And so yes, convergence does happen. But I think that to be able to then have a predictive power to say that yes, that they will converge on to this particular niche, mm -hmm. that is so speculative, I think. It, yeah. Well, I've, uh, my idea is that this idea has already been tested on Earth, and yeah. that is 
the tests are called New Zealand, Australia, South America, and Madagascar. And in other words, they've had tens and 50, 60, 70, 80 million years of independent evolution for vertebrates with brains. Yeah. And if there was a convergence on this human-like functionality of being really smart, mm -hmm. then we would have seen that uh, in one of these places. And my understanding is that that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think that, I think that, yes, and you know, it hasn't happened. And, you know, if you then pursue that same uh, train of thought and think of the, well, you know, what if then humans were extinct or yes. something like that, you know, are we going to have something else come along? Yes. That's going to be, you know, take out that same niche and yes. be intelligent. Yes. Uh, once again, what we know is that well, we have, have had examples of animals going extinct. The uh -huh. dinosaurs went extinct, and you know, furry mouse-like mouse-like creatures became mammals, yes. and then they radiated, and you know, got to the point where we have humans. But there is no way, in at least based on the idea of evolutionary biology, there's no way you can actually predict that you're going to come up with the same. Uh, evolution and the same adaptation when it even happens again. But but some so. niches seem to be convergent, like grass eating, and then yes. you didn't have a grass eater, the grass eater goes extinct, and then a new grass eater will come. Yeah. But human-like intelligence doesn't seem to be so. as generic or as convergent a feature as grass eating or... I don't, yeah, I don't think that we can, yeah, I don't think that same kind of intelligence is, this, is uh, you know, can be predicted in the same way. Okay. Okay, I mean, great. I find, I, I, I just, you know, based on my own understanding, I find it's fascinating and I think it's a good thought and it's worth, you know, that's where science experiments need to be designed or something you need to have. If somebody didn't have crazy ideas, then nobody's going to go and do the testing, you know, so it's important, but I don't, I myself don't subscribe to that idea. <laughs> okay. So have you seen the movie Planet of the Apes? I have not, actually. You have not seen the movie? Okay. I've heard enough about okay. it. Okay. <laughs> So you're not, maybe, maybe you don't have a curiosity part of your brain, is it? I see. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. So, again, oh, well, do you think we're alone in the universe? Well, I did used to read Carl Sagan a lot, and I would love to think that there is, you know, other intelligent life or some other kind of life out there. Uh, but I don't know. I'd love to know more. All right, so uh, we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> but do we have any reason to think that there are human-like intelligent creatures out there? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that, that the evidence has actually come in to suggest that there is the other intelligent or any other kind of non-intelligent or any other kind of you know, beings out there. Okay. Yeah. Now, is this a question you've ever thought of? Are we alone? Is that something you think about sometimes? Um, yes, because I have... Um, children and they ask me that question all the time. Really? Yes. And, and what do you say to them? And, and well, I, you know, it's it's nice to be, uh, you know, to think that there are other creatures or other things out there, uh, and we do think about those things a lot. But like uh, I always say, you know, we just have to wait and see. Yeah. <laughs> How about the Stephen Jay Gould's idea that if you replay this tape of life starting, for example, at the Cambrian explosion, yeah. that well, even go back even further, how about do you think that the divergence between plants and epistacons and then fungi and animals, these three major things, plants, fungi, and animals, mm -hmm. do you think those three categories would exist on other planets if there is life on these other planets? Well, I guess it would depend on what kind of material there is, what kind of, what kind of supporting environment or atmosphere is in those other environments. Well, for, yeah. well, for example, if let's, uh, well, there will be water yeah. and there will be some type of gas in the atmosphere, yeah. CO2 probably, yeah. and so they'll, how about photosynthesis? Do you think there'll be photosynthesis? Quite well, if the, those are then the one could think that they might be, but yeah. Do you play this game at all of let's replay the tape and see what happens again? Because that's essentially what that's we're trying to do in our exactly, heads because... Right. And so yeah. what do you think of that game? Well, I think that if you were to... Quite honestly, I think that if you were to play that tape and see how it plays out, it's quite, quite unlikely that it will play out in the same way. 
but how similar way? Not, we don't think it's going to be exactly the same. Probably, if they replayed the tape of life, English wouldn't re-evolve, and you and I wouldn't That's be right. sitting here. But yeah. would there be humans? Would there be encephalated bipeds? Yeah. Would there be apes? Would I, there be primates? Would I, there be mammals? Yeah, I, I have no reason to believe that there would be humans. How about yeah. primates? Not primates. How I about mean, mammals? Yeah, doesn't How about vertebrates? You have to be. How about eukaryotes? Any of those, yeah, go further down. No, I, no. I, there's no I, I really have no reason to believe that they would be, the, play, the tape would play out in the same way. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm asking yeah, not the same way. I'm asking so if any vaguely on. similar way. Can you? That's the that's yeah, the question. That would, yeah. I, yeah. I've, I mean, I pr probably if it was, you know, life were to evolve, then you probably would have to think of, you know, did, have, did it would it evolve with a of unicellular, multicellular organism, and so on. Maybe it would just be viral, maybe. It would be viral. Just viral, and yeah. never turn into a unicellular anything. Yeah, yeah. Could well be. Okay. Yeah. All right, so I've asked you a lot of questions. Have, what question have I forgotten to ask you? I don't know. I think that was your main question. Is <laughs> there life out there? Yeah. Now, here's a, I asked Colin uh, Groves about, you know, how similar we are to chimpanzees. Then I said, well, how are we more similar to gorillas than we are to chimpanzees? Because although chimps are a closer relative, in some ways we're closer to gorillas than we are to chimps, mm -hmm. in a very few ways. In a few ways. Now, what ways are, are they? Well, when they did the, when they mapped out the gorilla genome, they found that there were a few similarities between humans and, and uh, gorillas, and Chim apparently the similarities have to do with uh, some of our senses, particularly in our hearing. Apparently. Hearing? Yes. How, so what, in what sense? What I, well, I think that the genes that that code for hearing in humans are similar to the genes that really? in gorillas, yes. Hmm. And in terms of behavior, I think uh, there may, may well be similarities in the um, in our walking adaptations, because gorillas, particularly the big ones, end up being terrestrial. A lot, so they don't. Yeah. You know, they're far too big to be in the trees. Yes. So there may be similarities in their in their foot bones, for example, between hmm. humans and gorillas. Yeah. How about the differences between the intelligences of gorillas and chimps and orangutans and humans? How are they? For example, when I went to, I think it was Singapore, they had a zoo there, and they had the orangutans. And they said, "Oh, if you take a screwdriver and you put it in the cage of orangutan, they will." take it and play with it and then kind of hide it and then when you leave they'll use it to open a lock and then they said but the chimp they'll play with it for a little bit and then throw it away and is that do, is that consistent with what you know about these uh, um, other apes yeah I, I mean i think they they probably i mean i don't know whether you know what the, the level of but i do know that you know chimpanzees are quite intelligent and yeah, they can do and make tools and take them from one place to the other. Hmm. They're able to do that, and they do that in the wild a fair bit. Chimps are the uh, chimps, chimps do that. Yeah, and orangs the tangs. Orangs would do that too. They use tools okay. and they take them along with them. Yeah, I mean, this is these are you know not the zoo dwelling ones. These are the ones in the wild. Yeah. Now, all over the world, particularly in America, there's a controversy between what we've been talking about evolution and religious values. Mm -hmm. Now, apparent you teach evolution, so. A, once in a while, some student will say, I don't believe that because I'm a Christian or I'm a this or I'm a that. How do you deal with that? Well, the way I deal with it is by saying, I, you know, there is, you have a, it's fine to have a belief system. And most societies in the world have some kind of belief system. But that doesn't preclude an understanding of science. Because a rational mind, a rational mind has to have, you know, a rational reasoning, and there are both parts of your mind that probably there's a part of your mind that needs metaphysics and devotion and you know things that can't be explained. Mm -hmm. But there's also the rational part of your mind that actually needs an explanation, and both of those parts of your mind, parts of your mind can coexist. And so it's possible. The difference I think between um, religion and science is that religion. Uh, doesn't require proof. In fact, proof doesn't strengthen religion at all. Even if you were to bring proof to say that you know the, there's, this is scientific proof that the God exists, that just shouldn't make your faith any stronger. 
because it's not depending on proof at all. Mm. Whereas science is really entirely testable. It should be testable. Has, and that's the biggest difference, I think, between right. those two. In, but in terms of your class, has anybody gotten angry when you just... They do, yes. They, and what do they yes. say? Sure, you're wrong, you're bad, or...? Well, they can. They do say things like that. And I think it is uh, often because, you know, these are subjects that students have to enroll into. We hardly ever get... But they've already come into the subject knowing that that's what the tenet is. I see. Yeah. Um, so we don't have those debates happening a lot. But often, you know, particularly at the first stages when you're talking about evolution, and how that is um, different because I used to teach in the USA and that happened far more. It doesn't happen so much in Australia. Right. Why is that? Um, well, I think they, what, they, what they're expected to learn in school biology differs in Australia compared to the USA. <laughs> so you blame it on high school evolution, non-evolution <laughs> that's, that's, that's probably because they, but they, that's how they, they, they taught to debate that, I think. Yes. Biology classes so have you ever participated in such a debate between creationists and evolutionists in okay. Melbourne or somewhere else? Not in Melbourne. In America? But in America. And how did that yeah. go? Uh, it was all right. I mean, this is the, the main point is to be able to uh, make sure that you recognize that people have a belief and, you know, acknowledge that, and that is important. Um, but then try to understand that, you know, the principles of science and scientific thinking and scientific testing are quite different and try to explain, you know, how science works, which is slightly different. One problem with the field that you're working in mm -hmm. is that you're finding out the origins of people. Mm -hmm. And almost every culture has a traditional viewpoint deeply embedded in their religion mm -hmm. about how we got here. Mm -hmm. And so you're undermining those creation stories and their origin stories. And so that so that can't be good for, you know, in some ways you're disrespecting these things. So how do you deal with that? Um, well, it appears that way. I think and that is making, you know, trying to get them to understand that you're not um, necessarily trying to disrespect. I think the way I deal with it is I try to explain to them that there are, there are indeed so many religions in the world. And, you know, each religion has a different way of understanding how creation happened. And, you know, you can't so you just give them a miniature course in comparative religion, well, hoping that that will wean them of their individual <laughs> that, Let's not talk about Christianity, because, you know, there are so many <coughs> religions out there in the world. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I think that it, it is a difficult question to you know, talk so about. So essentially you're saying yeah. there are many religions, but only one science. That one science, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, how about UFOs now? Have you ever seen a UFO? Have you ever been abducted by aliens? Uh, no. How would you know? I don't know that I've ever landed in a place that I was. I, I mean, I've never even gone under the knife to have a surgery, so I have never had an experience. Okay. But, yeah. How about a, these aliens? So sometimes you, you've seen alien movies, I guess, maybe. Yeah. What kind of aliens would you like to find or make contact with? Um, From an emotional level, not your rational level. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, well, I would think I would like to make contact with very gentle and friendly. Gentle and friendly aliens, like E.T. That's yes. right. I want to call home, yes. but not like some not reptilian you. spider like thing that's no, going to eat you. No. <laughs> you know? Okay, so that seems like a minimal requirement for a good alien is that they're not going to kill you. No. <laughs> but how about in terms of. Do you want them to teach you about, you want knowledge from I these aliens, or do yes. you want... Yeah, I mean, being able to understand, you know, a different way of life, if, you know, the ability to communicate what it, what it is they, they experience, that would be nice, yeah. Okay, and how about, ch there seems, you said, you talked about just, uh, I'm looking at these skulls, mm -hmm. and that uh, we used to have a prognaceous jaw, and then it went in. Yes. Why did it go in? Well, this, so this is the, like I said, you know, there are many things that seem to have gone together there. The fact that we were not doing the same kind of heavy mastication. Oh, so um, prognaceous means, but, but, but wait a minute, my, I have a dog. It's got a really long snout, but it doesn't, I, it, ch it likes to chew on bones in the back, but not the front, the fronter for these. Yeah, know. I mean, I think partly it has to do with the fact that, yes, uh, that prognathism probably had something to do with mastication but not necessarily entirely mm -hmm. just chewing 
but I think that is those are, those two things seem to have gone together. You know, the face being pushed back mm. and essentially the brain case increasing. So that what we have now is a brain case that is a face that's far, very flexed compared to the brain case. It's difficult to know in among apes and even in monkeys, you know, what what were the driving factors in pushing the face back. But I think um, just going by the fact that we are related to, closely related to apes, and all the apes that we know do have big... Well, you said we're closely related to apes. I thought we were an ape. Well, closely related to the, to the apes as in chimpanzees, gorillas, and... I know that, but, but are you an ape? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's that's. I, I guess I speak in such a way because you know when I try to explain to students, I try to make sure that they understand that when I'm saying ape, I'm talking about a chimpanzee and a gorilla and a orangutan. I see but non-human yes, apes. A non-human ape. Yes. I see. Yes. Now, one other issue is that humans have big brains, and so when women give birth, mm -hmm. they, I guess, do females have a larger hole in their pelvis to allow that brain to come through? I, I've heard that, and then I thought that was true, but then I saw. I read some books by Sarah Blather Hurdy mm -hmm. on this, and she said that if you compare the brain size of neonates mm -hmm. to the pelvic hole that they come through, mm -hmm. that humans, it was not the case that humans had the tightest fit. Do you know anything about that? that you all, that's, that, sort of, that whole idea has sort of gone around in circles, I think, because there was a time when that's what it was thought that you know, were. Partly to do with, yes, we're giving birth to neonates that have a big brain case, but also partly to do with the fact that with the change to bipedal locomotion, the pelvis has changed changed its orientation. Oh, so it got maybe smaller, and so it had to... And so, in fact, to be able to transfer weight yes. from, from an upright back, you know, you want to make sure that your center of gravity is very close and it doesn't go too far apart. So you really don't want to be having hips that are too wide yes. because that's really going to throw your weight off and so it's important to have a, a pelvis that is good to be able to take your weight but at the same time to be able to give birth to infants that have big heads. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so we yeah, have lots of ideas about you know what the way the pelvis has changed in time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how about sexual selection? One theory about why our brains got bigger is that women were choosing men who were, I don't know, funnier or uh, had bigger brains and not stupid people. Mm -hmm. And that was the, it, in other words, human large brains is the sexual selection of women. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you have, what do you think of that idea? Well, you know, could well be. I mean, there's a lot of that sexual selection that may be happening, but I don't know whether the large brain size stands up to scrutiny just based on sexual selection. Well, how about yeah. your husband when he chose you? Did he choose you for your hips, your nose, your chin? I mean, what has he told you I about? I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether any of us, you know, can point to, you know, one set of characteristics mm -hmm. as being the thing that, you know, that we choose in mates. Mm -hmm. I think it's a combination of several things that come together. Okay. Yeah. It could well be, you know, they, the, it's their background, it's something that, you know, it's something that you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Could well be, and I don't know whether it's, you know, just intelligence. Of course, it, intelligence mm -hmm. could well be one of the things, and it's a match between individuals, isn't it? Yeah. And how about child care of these critters behind you? Do you think that males were less involved in child care than the females were in all of those species, or? Um, well, I think. Our parallels for that would once again have to be chimpanzees and gorillas. Modern chimpanzees. Yep. And Modern male chimp male gorillas, they would They don't do caring. They will care, I guess, if the infant is abandoned. Oh. Um, but it looks like the females and the female relatives are more likely to be the carers. So if there's an orphan chimpanzee, then, you know, the... the um, the females in the gang or the group will look after the infant more so than the males. How but about, not that they don't, but they will, yeah. How about when a white back, a silverback, mm -hmm. alpha male, mm -hmm. gets killed by a new alpha male? Mm -hmm. Will that new alpha male kill the babies? Oh, it doesn't happen so much. It happens in monkeys more so. But not but in actually, apes. Not so much in apes. Gibbons no, don't no. do that. No, but gibbons are quite different because gibbons are monogamous. Uh -huh. 
did not. Oh, I see. So, but gorillas yeah. are polygamous. Yeah. Gorillas but they, yeah. if I'm a, if I'm a new them. alpha, I don't go around killing the babies of no. the previous male. No, no. But whereas uh, baboons will do that. But no ape does that. No, I don't think so. No. Humans have a tendency to do that, I guess. In what? Where, the, where humans go and... Well, stepfathers are more guilty of murdering their stepchildren than they are of murdering their own children. Yeah, but is that... That's just a slight tendency, I'm wondering... a slight tendency, yeah. Yeah, I don't know whether there's a, you know, that can be explained from an evolutionary perspective, because usually when that happens with, um, with baboons, the idea is that that allows their, their genetic material to be passed down. You know, Do you, better, but there's, I don't know whether that same explanation goes with humans. Yeah. One thing that's said about human uniqueness is that we know that we're going to die. Mm -hmm. Do you think the other apes know that they're going to die? Do chimps know that they're going to die? How do they deal with death? Do you have well, any idea about that? I think they have a good... Well, when death does come, they seem to know what it means and they grieve in the same way. Do they? Yes. Yeah. Oh. They certainly do grieve. On, and, and they've got the very clear signs that, you know, when particularly the younger individuals, they do go through periods of, you know, grieving and depression These after are death. gorillas as well, or are you talking yes. about chimps? Yeah, chimpanzees. Orangutans? Sure, I think orangutans would as well, yeah. Huh. So yeah. do you think that grieving is one thing, but to say, hey, I'm going to die too? That's right. I don't know whether they actually have a sense about that. They are, you know, they, they seem to have a sense of self. So they all pass the but, mirror test? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, whether they have a sense of, you know, the future and that, you know, this is going to end. I don't know that it has been shown. How about incest? Do brothers and sisters have sex? Um, no. Perhaps in captive conditions. Not, I don't, don't think that they would in the wild. How about mothers and children and fathers and daughters? I don't think in the wild that's the case either. Yeah. No I other age. Well, I mean, you know, what bonobos do can be considered as being sexual, but as you know, that is just their behavior. Right, it's, right, not, right. it's not quite the same thing. They're not serious. Not in the same way. <laughs> not, yeah. not for procreation. Not for procreation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do any apes practice some type of uh, prophylactic? Do they, like, uh, for example, oh, we have yeah. hidden... Yes, we, yeah. I see what you mean. No, I, I, well, chimpanzees, when they're in heat, they, you know, copulate all the time. But I don't know whether they... These are chocolodites. Chocolodites, that's right. Yeah, bonobos are slightly different. But yeah, I don't know that they do. So how about coitus interruptus? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. I don't think that... I don't know that that has been documented in the... In, not even in a captive situation. I don't think so. Yeah. So they... So, and they don't... Females don't eat anything to make them abort like some uh, ancient that's human right. societies. No. Shown either that they would, uh, you know, they would try and abort an infant, or in fact, whether rape happens. Uh huh. In that, in the same I've heard rape in orangutans. That's right. But so not in right. chimps. Yeah. I mean, it may happen, I guess, to some extent, but I think because uh, their behavior is so different that um, forced. I mean, they're not in quite the same way. I think because they just they copulate in quite different ways. Humans, yeah. How about a, a silverback? Does he have like I don't know, fifteen females? Does he have a favorite female and then a next favorite? Or they do, yeah. They do. They do. Yeah. Chimps too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They certainly have. You know, there is a ranking system among the females as well. How about do the females have preferences for individual males? Absolutely, I think so. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, and they like uh, older men with well, lots of money. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sugar daddies, yeah, they like. Sugar daddies, yeah. I mean, so all of those concepts are so human. That, yes, you know, I know, but they. It's very difficult to translate them. <coughs> them. Well, what would a sugar daddy be in a chimp society? It is, is for example, but there's an age difference in human marriages, maybe a year or two or three, and that's like usually accepted and normal. Yeah. How about with with chimps and uh, gorillas and orangs? Well, is there an age difference? Th th I think that. If you think of the situation in the wild, where they're all exposed to the same conditions, I think the um, the difference in age is probably not nearly as marked. Uh -huh. Plus, you know, because their relationships are very much, um, you know, the relations of, of sexuality, they're probably not going to be able to have sex 
but all they do. So I don't think that the same concept can be applied. Or, or but there's no. But there's no menopause among these other apes, is right, there? Yeah. So there's no yeah. grandmother effect yeah, of... Well, interestingly enough, they do have... So grandmothers have, as you know, in humans, grandmothers are very important because yes, we do go through menopause. Which, and, and, yeah, and, then, and, and female, human females have a big role to play in... But no menopause. other apes go through menopause? Yeah, not quite in the same way, yeah. And are we the only ones who have hidden estrus? That's another thing, yes. We so we're special and well not I mean females are, female yes. human beings have hidden estrus and that's they have right. menopause that they have menopause. and that's yes. different from these other apes that's right yeah there's yeah. no hint of, of menopause in chimps at all um, well, I, well they live they don't live nearly as long as humans do uh, so that's right I see yeah. I see.